Hi, I'm Sarah Solis, Director of SAR Press, and I want to wish you all happy World Book Day. Welcome to our virtual book talk series. Today we're joined by Teresa Pasquale of Acoma Pueblo, Paul Reed, and Gary Brown, who will be discussing their book, Aztec Salmon and the Pueblo and Heartland of the Middle San Juan, the most recent volume in our popular archaeology series co-published with UNM Press. As we talk, please type all of your questions into the Q&A, and I'll share them as we go. Before we jump into the conversation, I'm going to ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, so Paul, would you mind going first? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor to be here with you, and I want to thank Sarah and the SAR folks for setting this up. Um, my name is Paul Reed. I work with Archaeology Southwest, um, a Tucson-based nonprofit. I myself am actually based a little bit north of Taos, so I'm coming to you this afternoon from what could be a snowy landscape later, um, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for coming, everyone. Teresa? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us for this uh, um, much anticipated discussion, um, something that is uh, wonderful for all of us who have had the chance to either uh, read about place or actually be in place. Uh, I come from Acoma Pueblo. Uh, I am speaking to you uh, from my village here. Uh, and like Paul, we are anticipating hopefully some kind of precipitation coming through. So good to see everybody. And Gary? Gary, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, technology is wonderful, I was saying. I'm Meanwhile, uh, talking to you from my home in Ventura, California, uh, we expect no snow or anything other than the boring, perfect weather that we tend to have around here. Um, I'm uh, from California originally, though I've spent about half of my life in New Mexico. I grew up and got and did my undergraduate uh, work in California, but then went to Arizona State University for my uh, masters. And uh, while I was there, I uh, took a, my first trip to New Mexico, uh, where I worked on a major excavation project at Solomon Ruins in 1976 uh, with the, the great archaeologist, Dr. Cynthia Irwin Williams. Uh, I uh, met my future wife on that project, even though we both took a very long road. Uh, Getting to that point, um, I worked uh, uh, throughout much of the Western United States traveling around and um, time tripping from Paleo Indian to uh, historic Anglo sites along the way. Um, I recently retired from the, the National Park Service. Um, I worked for that agency for 20 years and for quite a while. Um, in the, the private sector before that, doing uh, contract archaeology. Um, one of the highlights uh, was working uh, with the Park Service um, in partnership with uh, outfits like Archaeology Southwest and uh, um, doing uh, things like working with the team that uh, produced work we're talking about today with grants from the National Science Foundation. Uh, Paul Reed and I have never actually been employed at the, the same outfit, uh, but we've worked together on research and publication for 30 years, um, beginning with uh, uh, work on some of the earliest uh, Navajo sites in the, the middle San Juan area um, that archaeologists have been able to identify. Well, Aztec was my archaeology dream job, uh, but I left uh, New Mexico for another opportunity with the National Park Service here in California and to be closer to family on my side, uh, at least uh, during my final sprint for retirement. Uh, so here I am now on the beach and uh, happy to be uh, 
going back, planning a trip back to New Mexico next month if COVID allows that. We've got our vaccinations and hope to see the land of enchantment soon. Fantastic. Um, so Teresa, I'd like to direct my first question to you and um, I'd like you to tell us uh, what's so special about the Middle San Juan region and its Pueblo heritage. Well, thank you for uh, that question. And, uh, you know, there are many people, many, many Pueblo uh, people who have um, strong connections to that landscape. Uh, it is one that um, for various reasons uh, factors into our uh, migration histories as Pueblo people, um, but it also uh, is a place that can be personal for, for many of us. Uh, I grew up uh, alongside um, my sisters um, and we were fortunate that we were able to hear uh, my father's stories of place. And when the opportunity came to talk about that landscape and why it was significant to um, Pueblo people, uh, and I thought about those stories that my father had shared with me. And in much the same way, I, I uh, think back to all of our, uh, ancestral Pueblo people uh, who migrated and moved on that landscape on generations ago. And they too must have had their own stories of place. Uh, if uh, folks are not familiar with that San Juan area, it is a very vast landscape. Uh, one that is full of um, natural features that our people uh, connected to many mountains and mesas, but in that area specifically near Aztec is the sources of water, uh, which are very predominant for, uh, for Pueblo people. Uh, mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a confluence of sorts that goes on between the rivers that flow through that area. And as uh, many Pueblo people uh, and many of our, our uh, tribal relatives uh, note that water is very significant to us. And so it made sense when I, in my younger days, uh, journeyed with my father um, to that area that one of the first things that he would point out would be that source of water. Uh, as our people settled in these areas, if you look at uh, various areas in, in that southwestern area, especially in the middle San Juan, that is the first thing uh, folks tend to look for is where did they get their water? In this, in this place that seemingly to many of us looks like a desert area, uh, this is a place where uh, water was, was uh, accessible to them. And, and so much of our existence as, as descendants of uh, our people there um, centers around water. We, we, we pray for it. We, we, it manifests in our songs, in our daily life. Um, it also uh, is something that is, that is connected to us at almost every aspect of our being. And as one, and as one would say, one cannot exist without water. So uh, I think that's what makes um, this place um, not only beautiful, um, but an appropriate place where our ancestors decided to settle. And as part of that settlement then became part of their overall story, their migration story, which was handed down to us. And I think that as folks probably have seen throughout examples in this book, if they've read the book, we'll see that our people were knowledgeable. They were, uh, they were scientists and architects and artists in their own right. And they uh, wrote for us the, the path for which our Pueblo people will become um, known for today. So that's part of what I wanted to share with you all. Thank you, Teresa. Paul, would you like to add anything to that? 
Sure. Thank you, Teresa. I think that really uh, orients us well as we begin and continue our discussion. Um, <clears throat> what, what informs, I hope, my view of this area was the time that I spent working um, at the site at Solomon Pueblo, um, at, the, at the Solomon Ruins Museum. I was fortunate to start there in 2001. And um, at that point, I was tasked with finishing, um, really bringing to fruition research that, as Gary mentioned, Dr. Cynthia Earn Williams, her staff and students had conducted in the 1970s at the site. Um, and they had finished a report that um, satisfied grant obligations and other things, but it definitely wasn't the report that she envisioned. And unfortunately, her life was cut short tragically in 1990, um, I think well before she reached her peak. Um, but about 10 years after that, uh, Executive Director Larry Baker and um, our director and president at uh, Archaeology Southwest, Bill Doley, got together and decided to put their heads together and figure out how to, you know, really try to do justice to this incredible project. So that was a project that um, really was amazing for me. I had worked in areas around Chaco, um, but never at really a fairly legitimate, I guess we could say Chaco outlier. So a lot of my view of the Chaco and world is formed by this time at Solomon Pueblo and, and working um, with the amazing collections there. Um, and as Gary and I started to talk about the book and what we really wanted in about 2012, 2013, we felt like this area in between Chaco and Mesa Verde, if, if we could pop up the map again, that would be great. Um, we felt like the middle San Juan had probably been overlooked a little. Um, certainly, uh, you know, Earl Morris's work at Aztec drew quite a bit of attention in the 19 teens when he focused there. But a lot of what really informs public understanding and even what archaeologists say about this area comes from, you know, these two amazing centers, uh, Mesa Verde, fairly close to the north, and then Chaco Canyon, you know, about 50 miles, 75 kilometers south. Um, but, you know, again, as we did this research, me at Solomon, Gary at Aztec, a variety of other researchers plugging in in different areas, we felt like we should really present, not just for a scholarly community, but for a much larger audience, what was really exciting and interesting about this region. So that was sort of the genesis of this project. Having Teresa involved, um, from the beginnings of our discussions and wanting her to bring the very important descendant community perspective was critical as well as we thought about how best to approach this. And, and then working with the staff at SAR to really try to present information for the public uh, using non-jargon laden language and really just trying to speak to people through our writing about what was really exciting and interesting. So. So that's something that I know is high on my list, high on Gary's list. And I think all of our authors, Teresa in particular, really took that to task and really wanted to do that. And I think, um, you know, the fact that this, this book did win an Arizona New Mexico Book Award is testament to the efforts of our authors to try to reach people and talk to them about this very interesting region. And certainly the book covers, you know, this movement of people out of the Chacoan Center to come up into an area that had Pueblo people living there for hundreds of years, particularly in the La Plata Valley um, to the west of Solomon and Aztec. But then for these folks coming up to pull in people who had lived in this region for hundreds of years and really create what I think of as multi-ethnic multi communities. Now, certainly these are all well within an ancestral Pueblo and tradition that developed over many hundreds of years. But the area was none, nonetheless distinct, both from Mesa Verde to the north and Chaco to the south. And so what flourished in the region was a very interesting and unique, um, you know, version of how Pueblo people relate to land, how they relate to sky, how their cosmology comes into play, how they pursue the pursuit of um, corn agriculture and how their rich ceremonial culture then developed all around these places. Um, and as Teresa noted, these places are still very important to, 
to Pueblo people today. And that connection is unbroken. We archeologists sometimes and members of the public look at places and they seem abandoned and deserted, deserted to us, but that is really the wrong way to look at it as, as we've been taught. And those of us who have taken the lesson, the places are very much alive. So that's, that's how I orient to these areas. And I think, you know, there's, there's much learned and, and the hope in the, in the book really was to let people have at least a version of an understanding about what, you know, what we think happened in the past, something that I know will add to. And Pueblo people hopefully will add to this as we go through time. Gary, um, Paul was just talking about some of the aspects of this area that are really exciting. Could you give us an uh, example of that from the archeology? span Oh, from the archaeology, I think that uh, the uh, archaeology is fascinating and that the middle San Juan is a, a, an archaeological and even a, a much more than that, a cultural transition between areas uh, such as Mesa Verde and Chaco. It's much more than that in that it's a, a hybrid that is the result of people uh, coming together and sharing ideas about how to um, pursue the Chaco and tradition. Um, and with the uh, Mesa Verde tradition, it actually is something that uh, some people who've, who have suggested not purely as a, uh, um, saying, just simply saying that, but that uh, Aztec actually led the way rather than Mesa Verde and the, the post Chacoan world in terms of reinventing uh, the way that Chacoan traditions were pursued. So the archeology span of this uh, area that we might consider transitional, it is in so many ways as Teresa has uh, described uh, between these beautiful snow-capped mountains uh, to the north and the, the high desert canyon uh, country to the south and west uh, of the Rocky Mountains. It's a transition for sure, uh, uh, but much more than that, uh, it's an area that I would characterize as a gateway between those two areas. And in a lot of ways, it's that gateway position that uh, allowed people to um, uh, facilitate trade and other forms of interaction and exchange between the areas um, and uh, develop a, a very distinctive and unique hybrid type of uh, cultural uh, transition, which is uh, a major reason I think that the um, when Paul and I put our heads together on uh, how to characterize the middle San Juan, I think we both felt a little bit frustrated at the area so frequently being characterized mainly as a transition rather than a unique place in and of itself. Um, and that's a major reason why we chose the term heartland to characterize the uh, the area in our title of the book. It's, it's a very distinctive heartland, um, the uh, place where a lot of different diverse ideas came together and were uh, reinvigorated and uh, uh, I think are a, a spectacular example of what people can do when they celebrate diversity and put their minds together, put their efforts together, come together and do great things. Mm -hmm. So we're getting a couple of questions in. Um, we have a question from Mark, which asks, population wise, which area was more densely settled, Mesa Verde or the region around Aztec and Selman? Funny. Um, we should ask that question. Paul and I asked that question and attempted to do uh, some demographic uh, reconstructions uh, of the area. And it's a tricky one because um, I, I think that it, it depends. Scientists always say that, but it really does depend on 
what time we're talking about. So the, um, the area was uh, densely occupied, but um, in, in terms of the actual concentration of settlement, I would say that um, you had more people aggregated in Chaco Canyon in its heyday and at Mesa Verde proper in its heyday uh, than uh, the, the very central part of the, the middle San Juan, even during its heyday. Uh, they were all very well populated. And during the period um, in the 1100s and 1200s, uh, the population throughout the area was incredibly uh, large huge number of people. And it's been argued by some that people really stressed the environment and that a major uh, issue with the, the situation leading to the depopulation of the area in the 1200s, the end of the 1200s, uh, was that they had, oh, they had taxed, overreached uh, on the landscape in terms of the carrying capacity. But most of the uh, paleo environmental work that, that's taken a really serious look at that situation does tend to conclude that there were options, that there were other reasons, um, other things going on in addition to just simply dense population. But um, I, I think that um, the middle San Juan, um, Chaco and Mesa Verde all were uh, very heavily populated areas that um, saw um, a distinctive peak going on in those, those uh, areas. Um, and where the largest number of inhabitants resided, I'm not sure I would uh, try to hazard a specific guess on those numbers, Paul might. Um. Yeah, no, I appreciate Gary's discussion. Um, I'll, I'll throw out some numbers because we spent some time on it. Um, we feel like at peak, which in the middle San Juan, about 1250, 1260, we have at least 6,000 people in that area. I think that's undercounted because we base that on the sites we're aware of and mostly sites on public land or the ones on private land that have been pretty well documented. So that's probably a minimum number. I know folks working up across Greater Mesa Verde in the Northern San Juan, if we go all the way from Southeast Utah over to Chimney Rock, people have said between 25 and 30,000. So, you know, there's a bigger group of people up there. Um, but I would circle back to Aztec and say that that's probably the most densely, one of the most densely occupied settlements in the region. Aztec's probably got two to 3,000 people at its peak in the 1200s. So, you know, these are large settlements, like Gary said, and really compared to what we see during the Chaco era, we have more people on the landscape by the 1200s than we had in either the 900s, 1000s or 1100s. So that played its role, I think, in potentially stressing out environments and the like. But, you know, I, I think that Pueblo society at the time was going through some other transitions as well. And I think new traditions were coming in. And, and I think when Chaco went through its period of fluorescence and then, you know, some decline after 1100 and 1125, I think that sort of reset the way people were thinking about a lot of things. And I think some of that probably contributed ultimately to people deciding that, you know, they might be better off in homes to the west, to the south, or to the east of this, this core area of the Pueblo Heartland. Um, I'm sure Teresa has some thoughts as well. Thanks, Paul. You know, um, there are a number of factors that, that Pueblo people refer to as um, uh, reasons for, for why those areas uh, were um, not meant to serve us in perpetuity. Uh, there were other factors that, that came into play that meant it was time for our people to move into what are now the present day um, Pueblo communities. And even, at, even if you look at our present day Pueblo communities and their populations, uh, we know that it takes uh, quite a bit of infrastructure to be able to support um, 
our Pueblo communities. And even if we look at modern uh, towns and municipalities, we know that it takes quite a bit of resources. So if you then begin to look at the footprint of what remains of those places, um, it's easy then to, to start to see that uh, as populations grew, as uh, the complexity of their societies began to expand, uh, that those places, uh, we will outgrow those places uh, and that, uh, that we will look at other places in which to settle. Now, it doesn't mean that those places were abandoned as is the typical terminology that is used um, to refer to some of these sites is to say that they are abandoned. Uh, nothing in our nothing in our value system or in the way that we reference places of the past talks about abandonment because those places are imbued with those values that we hold dear as Pueblo people uh, and because they are significant in our um, histories as Pueblo people that those places are still very much alive, very much in uh, uh, imbued with those values that make us who we are. And so those places still factor into prayer, into song. We have Pueblo people who, who make, their, make their journeys there. Uh, and so those places are, have never been abandoned. And I think that's one thing uh, to underscore in part of this conversation. Um, Paul, we have a question about the chronological relationship between Chaco, Mesa Verde, and Aztec. And then I wonder if you and Gary could maybe just explain a little more about what the relationship was between the Middle San Juan and Chaco and Mesa Verde. Okay. Um, well, you know, at its, at its sort of broadest level, um, all three of these areas have settlement in the major Pueblo periods that we talk about. So we have Basket Maker 2, Basket Maker 3, you know, we're talking around the, the common era, 400s, 500s, 600s, and then all the way to the 1200s in all three of these places. But the way that was configured looks very different. Um, so in the middle San Juan specifically, the areas around Bolsolman and Aztec don't seem to have a lot of that early settlement. So we have some sites, really limited numbers of sites in the 900s, 1000s, and 1100s. Um, but then the communities experienced large growth with Chacoan people coming up in the late 10 hundreds. And that's when we really see the population booms at Bolsolman and Aztec. Now, if we go up river from there in the Navajo Reservoir area and uh, other areas, you know, up those rivers, there is substantial early populations there. Um, and then of course, Chaco has, you know, a lot of settlement in the 500s and 600s during what archaeologists anyway call the basket maker three period. So there's not really a good way to say, you know, this area is earlier, this one's middle and this one's later. Um, they overlap each other. Um, what we think of as perhaps the most spectacular parts of Mesa Verde archaeology tend to be after 1200. So all of the large cliff dwellings and some of the biggest sites in the Mesa Verde region post date 1200. Um, so I think it is fair to say that that's perhaps Mesa Verde's, you know, I don't know, one of the peaks in, in that region is after Chaco has sort of passed through its period of prominence and other things happen. So I can certainly hand off to Gary and, and get his thoughts. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, all of it. Um, I think all three areas have got uh, the full trajectory of Pueblo and occupation up until the uh, late 1200s when the uh, large scale depopulation and the migrations uh, to areas where the Pueblo people uh, still live today. Um, th th there's that full sequence. Um, but one of the common things is that all three of those areas were uh, heavily depopulated. Uh, it's, I, I appreciate Teresa's remarks. It certainly was not an abandonment as uh, most of us think of abandonment, turning around, locking the door, walking away, never going back to that area. It lived on in the 
traditions, but uh, the vast majority of those people, large numbers, uh, pursued large-scale migrations to other areas and uh, created a, a situation that we uh, contemplate today. And we don't really have the right words. Uh, the Pueblo people uh, may have the right words in their uh, own language and traditions to describe this process, but uh, the way we think of things, it's it's hard to describe that uh, such a, a large ending to an uh, incredibly vibrant uh, way of life centered in that area, moving off to other places without throwing out these inadequate words like abandonment or that sort of thing. Um, but certainly, I think that it, with reference to the initial question, um, despite the fact that people were in all three of those areas uh, leading a, a very productive and uh, intriguing way of life um, throughout the, the whole trajectory, um, clearly it was Chaco where some of the greatest and biggest sites uh, showed up at an early date in the 800s already. Uh, people at Pueblo Benito were building multi-story great houses, these uh, incredibly impressive monumental structures and that sort of thing. And this was long before, um, as Paul describes, the impressive sites at Mesa Verde uh, with uh, three and four story buildings that are so well preserved in the cliff dwellings and that sort of thing. They, these don't show up until the 1200s, a little bit in, in uh, the uh, 1100s. Um, so, you know, a lot of the greatness has its origins in uh, Chaco, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything started there and people radiated out and took uh, migrations and uh, started up uh, the same thing in these other places. They were interacting. They were living in these places the whole time. Teresa, uh, Michael asks, what distinguishes the Pueblo culture from the Aztec and Salmon cultures? And was there more than one Pueblo culture at that time? So I wonder how you think about the, you know, the different groups of people who are living in different places and moving around. How would you describe describe those groups or the, the group? Sure. So, um, you know, my I can only speak from uh, my own experience, from what has been uh, shared with me uh, through um, through what my father has 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 informed. Uh, my 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 Pueblo perspective, my Pueblo world. I've been fortunate over the years to be able to have uh, worked closely with uh, elders in my community, uh, some who were elder male relatives who uh, shared with me what what their own perspectives was. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate that over time, you know, many of those elders have now passed, even like my own father. And, and there's always that, there's always that question if we had just one more time to ask that one more question. Um, but also in this work, uh, because my background is in archeology, span I've also been fortunate to speak with other Pueblo communities who talk about their relationship to, uh, to these places and, and, over the course of time, we find that, uh, and I'm sure that anybody who has researched area has, that specific area has found that when, in, when talking with descendant communities, we find that every community has its own unique relationship to place. And so even though we, even though we talk about uh, um, this area, and, and my perspective was included in this book. We have to remember that there are a multitude of um, perspectives and connections to that area. So there are, there are ties by 
uh, the Pueblo of Jemez and the Pueblo of Laguna and the Pueblo of Zuni and the Hopi tribe in Arizona, who all have um, histories uh, that connect them to that place. Um, and so, so it, it's difficult to say, um, to simplify it, I suppose, uh, as, as that question uh, kind of moves towards. Um, but I would say, you know, when we are talking about those things, uh, one of the things that um, we, I think, reference is, is movement. Um, movement of place, how long people were there, uh, how long did people occupy that place, and, and what was its, its significance. And those are, its significance is always going to be different for every um, modern Pueblo community. And you can hear that when they explain their ties. Uh, and those are stories that, of course, aren't aren't publishable. We don't we don't necessarily share those stories uh, with people outside of our community because we hold those uh, stories, those histories, closer to us. Um, but we can say that during those periods of formation, as 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 what we now call present day Pueblo people, we have to remember that. Pueblo wasn't a name that we gave ourselves. That that was a a term that that came uh, from the colonizers. Uh, we had different terminology back then for ourselves. Simply um, to go back in time, oftentimes we reference the people. Um, we hadn't we hadn't begun yet to formulate what is now the present day uh, pueblos of New Mexico. But if we go back then, we can look at what were those lessons, what were what were the things that were um, were being were coming about in terms of skills, and some of that is located in this book, and and we have some really good examples of um, of textiles and weaving, and um, uh, how people were how people were uh, using the materials that were given to them. And so all of that knowledge and all of that um, movement on the landscape as people were, were uh, um, connecting to others in different communities because there were settlements in different places, uh, allow people to formulate those special ties. And so um, when we talk about um, depopulation and movement on a landscape, what I think is most important for me to convey to the audience is that we tend to look at things as very linear, to say, here's the occupation of a settlement at this point in time, here's where it depopulated, here's the increase in population, and here's the decrease, and it's very linear. But we also know archaeologically that we have examples in which settlements may have been reoccupied over time for brief moments of time before permanent places were settled, um, and that and that for us in what is now present-day Pueblo culture, uh, in our perspective, in, in terms of our own home communities, we don't look at things as linear. We look at things um, as both past and present and future tense, but also uh, the ability to go back is very much, uh, can be a very real present Thing. So that concept of movement, that concept of time is very different for our Pueblo people. So I, I hope that um, we could spend an entire lifetime discussing this and still not get to a solid uh, one simple answer. But I hope that has, has shed a little bit more of Pueblo perspective on, on that question. That was an amazing answer. Um... Paul, someone, Linda asks, um, did the Ute tribe have any role in this area? 
No, as as far as we can tell, no. It, it's it's a fairly it's a pretty short answer. I have seen some really interesting recent research that suggests that you know just north of our area up in Colorado that we may have some groups um, that would be culturally classified as as you people you know maybe 700 800 BCE. So this is fairly new information and a couple of really interesting sites that I've really just basically read a couple of paragraphs and abstract type information on. But as far as we know, these sites are all Puebloan, they're Puebloan ancestry, and we don't have other groups um, involved during these time periods. Um, Mark asks, maybe Gary or Paul, I'm not sure, um, is, was there, or Teresa, um, was there much interaction between the Middle San Juan and the Guyana region? I would say no. The Guyana region is fascinating um, in that uh, it looks like it's a, an area that was very much contained within itself and not part of these uh, grand ideas that were playing out at places like Chaco fairly early and later on uh, at Aztec and Mesa Verde. Uh, I think that it's a really, really interesting uh, cultural area that looks to be quite provincial and quite different than the, uh, um, the things that were playing out in the uh, area where Chaco and influence in these uh, monumental great houses were constructed. The Guyana made amazing structures. There's, there's famous uh, adobe walled towers and, and uh, they clearly were very competent folks living in a, a harsh environment up along the continental divide, high elevation farming and that sort of thing going on. Really, really interesting, but I don't think that they wanted any part of the big city cosmopolitan stuff that was going on at Chaco and Aztec, Salm and places like that. That's my take on that mm -hmm. situation. Um, Paul, I don't think this was something you, you all focused on in the book too much, but um, Marilyn asks about uh, pictographs and petrogly petroglyphs. Um, and how they figured into this area uh, and whether uh, different images are connected to different groups or time periods. Um, I would say that compared to other areas, certainly like Southeast Utah, Bears Ears, you know, um, even up around Navajo Lake upstream from where we're talking about, the area is, is really um, lacking in a lot of significant high frequency rock art and imagery. So I think that that challenges us in some ways. Now downstream from Salmon along the San Juan on some private property, there are some very interesting petroglyphs and pictographs. Those haven't really been studied fully and really haven't been put into a context. Some of them are definitely, you know, they fit what we know about Pueblo motifs and icons for this time period. But I would say it's really kind of a missing piece. And, and, and really, if, you know, we think about it from an artistic perspective, um, the areas right around Solomon and Aztec, uh, in particular, lack the large canvases, the big sandstone, especially the darker sandstone formations that would have allowed different forms of expression and durable expression. We tend to have the softer, um, sort of more crumbly sandstones. One type in particular is called the Ojo Amarillo sandstone, and it really is just not a very ideal medium for um, pecking and different types of painting on the rock. So I'm not gonna say it didn't happen because that would be, I think, incorrect and an overstatement, but we don't have a whole lot of surviving rock art. So, um, you know, Chaco of course has amazing rock art and a, uh, an avocational researcher, uh, her name is Jane Culver, is in the process of putting together a book that I think will really help um, sort of everyone's understanding of that. But I'm, I'm, we really lack that in our area. Mm -hmm. um, Priscilla asks if any of you have explored how the uh, Samalas eruption in Indonesia in 1257 and then the year without a summer uh, contributed to dispersal in the area that we're talking about. 
Gary, anyone? Well, um, we're asking the, uh, perhaps the, the wrong people. Tom Wines could uh, turn that into an entire talk. He's uh, fascinated with uh, volcanic eruptions and how they've uh, affected uh, global climate. And of course, uh, climate change these days is a huge topic. And we do know that volcanoes have uh, a lot to do with that. Uh, we also have the sunset crater eruption in Arizona, much closer to home, that um, the dating on that eruption shows that it happened when people at Salmon and Aztec were at home and, and must have been blown away. They would have seen the prevailing winds even and are blowing in the direction that they would have uh, been well aware of what was going on, even without talking to refugees who were chased out of the, the area by the uh, eruption of Sunset Crater. Um, but specifically, I think we uh, are just barely beginning to understand the effects of, of distant uh, events, like and particularly volcanic eruptions on the uh, uh, paleoclimate of the area. It's a, Great question, a great topic, and uh, one that uh, I mentioned, Tom Wines, who um, really look forward to hearing more from his uh, synthesis of the, the global situation. Uh, but most of what we know about the, the paleoclimate of this period of time is based on tree rings, and we don't um, know exactly what's causing all those changes. We know based on the very precise chronology and uh, the identification of drought years and wet years and the uh, pattern of climate change through time. We know plenty about it, but we don't know that much about what's causing it. The other thing that I would say just real briefly is um, the, the climate is obviously an environment we're both very important to Pueblo people during this time, but I'm not really on the, um, you know, the boat of saying that the, the great drought is as it's been called. And this is, you know, roughly about 1273 to 1299. You, you know, the old view in southwestern archaeology was that that, you know, caused people to begin to migrate and settle in other places. The concern I have with that is there was a more was a more major drought in the 12th century between about 1130 and 1180 that you know didn't cause a large-scale depopulation and we saw some movement of people certainly so i think we have to think you know as, and i think teresa said this really well to think about a, the complexity of factors involved in people's choices and this was a pueblo heartland you know the entire four corners region for 2000 years so i don't think a drought that that started in the 1270s was you know, the sole cause for people to decide that they should migrate and, and find a different place to live. Did it influence them? I, I think it certainly did. But, you know, I think there's just a multitude of factors. So I like to, you know, I, I'm not trying to complicate the world unnecessarily. But I think, you know, we, we really need to look for multi-causal things if we really want to understand what happened. Um, Teresa, Lorian wonder, I know you sort of touched on this in your last answer, but Lorian wonders um, if you could say a bit about whether different Pueblo communities tend to think of some areas of the North as more important than others to their own specific community. I, I wouldn't say um, more important. I would, I would categorize that as um, all places are significant. They're all important. Um, what becomes more significant is what was learned in those places at that time. Uh, like, like any um, human population, and even if we look into our own, our own histories as individuals, um, our journey in this lifetime we, we uh, talk about life lessons. We talk about the things that we have accumulated and been taught and learned uh, as we move through our time here in this world. Uh, and so our ancestral Pueblo people were, were no different. They were no different in that they were 
uh, living in this landscape, learning about that landscape, learning uh, how to um, be good stewards, how to maintain um, balance in this world that was created for them, but also um, much like us ha had an eye on the future of what will come next, who will come next after them. And, and much in the same way, we're preparing their life uh, and their world um, to pass on that information uh, to future generations. So I don't I don't like to think of those places as being one more significant than the other uh, in terms of, of the role that they played uh, in teaching lessons or uh, allowing our ancestors to, uh, to develop their, um, the societies that will, will come about uh, in terms of our public communities, that, that, that organization that we now see in our, in our public communities, uh, those that factored into every single um, time spent in any one of those. So one was not more important than the other. Did they certainly, uh, um, are there characteristics that say that certain things were were um, were cultivated more or organized more in certain areas? Yes. Can we look at certain places that have an emphasis on trade? Yes. Can we look at certain places that might have an emphasis on um, pottery making, or we see uh, different motifs? Uh, and embellishments that that are are present, say in say in uh, color choices or in the pottery or textiles. Yes, um, but to say one is more significant than other, I think if if you talk to Pueblo people, they would not they would not use that word to say one is more important than the other. They are all important. Um, I have another question for you, but I hope that you can all um, speak to it. Um, Joseph says, Teresa mentioned oral history and stories coming down from ancestors. How does archaeology and other scientific research either inform or challenge these oral traditions? Um, is there an embracing of the scientific research or is it seen as threatening? Oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, a very good question. Um, and I'm not sure quite where to start, except to say, say this. Um, I think uh, if you look back into the history of um, archaeology, especially here in the Southwest, um, and archaeology as a, as a discipline, uh, we can look back and definitely see where um, those oral histories were ex excluded or not included uh, as part of people exploring this, this area. Uh, certainly over time, we, we, and we're happy for it, um, that we have advanced in our ways of thinking and our ways of doing research to know enough now, uh, and I say we because I am a student of, of archaeology, um, we know now and we know better um, that in order to pursue some of these veins of research, that it is not enough to simply collect data. It is not enough uh, to simply um, pull uh, research that has been done that has excluded uh, Pueblo voice. It is why, um, and, I, and I've been fortunate, it is the reason why I have been fortunate to work both with Paul and with Gary, because they have continuously underscored the need and the importance of including that tribal perspective. Uh, because our knowledge of this landscape is, is uh, vast in terms of time, but also uh, the technology that exists now 
that is less invasive, that doesn't require the old methodology of doing archaeology where um, people were taking uh, from our ancestors, where things were uh, ending up in uh, curation facilities, uh, where we had to have the establishment of NAGPRA as a law in order to uh, have those things returned to their descendant communities. I like to think that we as, as um, people who have studied archeology span have learned from those instances and those examples in that we now value uh, the information that is shared with us, uh, but we are also respectful that not everything is shared with us from descendant communities. And so I, I have yet to see, at least here in the Southwest amongst my colleagues, um, where they have ever felt threatened, um, both, by, both between what is shared and not shared. And uh, even though um, at times in our past history where the discipline has been detrimental um, in instances to some of our communities, I think that the profession and the discipline has been open to learning from those instances and learning from our descendant communities when it has and how best to avoid that in the future. And it's collaborations like this uh, and discussions like this that we learn from one another. So I hope that answers that question. Gary, do you have any thoughts? Oh, I think that it's it, it's a outstanding topic. I it's it's a little bit uh, frustrating being a, a southwestern archaeologist sometimes because uh, I understand the the reasons um, we we depend on archaeologists like Teresa who have access to the traditions and uh, were told these stories have heard this um, and can ask questions and get answers that as a uh, an Anglo archeologist, I can try to solicit information that would help with um, uh, archeological research. And I also feel like as archeologists, we have data, really good information that would contribute to the descendant people in terms of their understanding and appreciation of their distant past. Um, and we, we have a, a long way to go, I think, in terms of bridging the gaps that uh, we have amongst us in, in that regard. I completely understand and respect the, the reasons, the colonial experience in the Southwest and certainly here in California was brutal. Native people were uh, not treated well in many, many cases and there's reasons for the, the lack of trust um, of us white skinned folks that are curious about what happened in these places before written history, before uh, Spaniards or other people came and wrote down what they saw and uh, described their experiences and, and that sort of thing. Well, that's what archaeology is all about. We're trying to understand this. We're trying to uh, reconstruct the past. It, it, a lot of it has to do with place. It's, I don't think uh, there's many archaeologists who intend to be invasive and um, try to tell people what their past was like when they have their own traditions and oral histories about it. Um, but there's a, a different kind of information that's accessible through archeology, span through tree rings, things like that. Um, and I really look forward to the day that we can work together uh, more and welcome the opportunity to have this dialogue to collaborate with uh, archaeologists who are uh, descendant people who have a, a, a biological and a cultural connection to that past we're, we're trying to understand. I really hope we can 
build the the trust and get to that place. But um, I think we do have a ways to go. I really want to live to see the day that um, we're doing that. Paul? Well, and I, I think Theresa and Gary said it really well. I would say that um, I, I think American archaeology is in the midst of a, a pretty dramatic transformation. And I, 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 there's definitely some holdouts, but I see more and more younger people who really have mapped onto this issue in exactly the right way. And their understanding that, you know, non-Indigenous archaeologists, we're not working with our own histories and we need to be a lot more sensitive than we have been in the past. Um, if you look at uh, American archaeology's kind of arc of, of progress or lack of progress, we went through decades when archaeologists didn't speak to Native peoples about their stories or anything that, that Native folks would have been willing to share. Archaeology got very scientific with new archaeology in the 60s, 70s, and well into the 80s. And I think certain things were learned, but we really, we really blew it in my, from my perspective on connecting to the descendant communities, to the folks who have the knowledge. So, you know, I'm happy to say that our organization had, did a collaborative project with um, the Pueblo of Acoma. We have one with the Pueblo of Zuni that we hope to launch this year if, if conditions are good. And I think, again, as a discipline, we're making the right steps to learn about things, but I, I don't see this as an oppositional thing, at least in the work that we've done. And I think, what's going to make that non-oppositional is for archaeologists to realize that, you know, we have treated Native people's histories as our own special research area, and we've really put aside a lot of the concerns that have been out there. And I think, you know, um, to, to use an analogy, our ears are finally unstopped in many ways for many of us, and we're ready to do true collaboration. But that, that means not going to a tribe and with a project 90% done and saying, hey, would you would you tell me what you think about this? It's stepping way back and, and working with groups and saying, what are your research interests? Are there things where we can get together and help understand the past better? And again, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I, I, we do have a long ways to go, but I think we're, I think we're making progress. Um, I think that we are going to finish up here since we're over an hour and I'm afraid there are so many questions we're not going to get to. But just to finish up, um, kind of a related question from Colin, who I think is asking, um, do you have any advice for someone who's planning to become an archaeologist? And, you know, what directions do you think um, the field will take? Um, research, uh, things that you think are interesting. I know you were just talking a bit about that now, but um, do you have any final thoughts on, on where you might go in the future? Um, maybe we could go Paul, Gary, Teresa. Sure. I mean, just just really briefly, I, I think the type of close cooperation and work with indigenous communities really throughout the world is the way to go. And I think in American archaeology, I do think we need to continue this transformation. And if I was going to get into archaeology as a younger person and, you know, a younger up and coming scholar, I would work tremendously hard to develop connections with the peoples whose histories I was interested in. And I would, I would really probably honestly put aside some standard archaeological training and reading and really work more on the side of indigenous histories. Um, there are so many things that as, as I've gone through my own personal transformation over about 10 years now, there's so many things that I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm playing catch up. And I think as a younger person, um, it, it's possible to really um, catch that wave and start thinking about it differently right now. So that's my advice, young man, <laughs> or person, sorry. I completely agree with uh, everything that, that Paul just said, uh, absolutely. Um, and uh, another piece of advice would be uh, to get uh, really good with uh, high-tech approaches. Teresa has already mentioned. Um, we need to figure out ways to, uh, to get at archaeological data without digging up sites and destroying them. Um, and I think that um, that's my own experience in the National Park Service was fantastic as a guy who spent half a life um, doing primarily ex destructive excavation. And it was for a good reason. There were mines, there were highways, there were pipelines that were gonna destroy these sites. So 
uh, we got in there first and got very good information out of the sites before that. Um, but um, there's also ways to uh, get at a lot of the information we need uh, without doing uh, work that is as destructive as traditional large-scale excavation. And we need this kind of really targeted approach that makes the most of high-tech um, techniques for getting uh, information and then very specific targeted uh, limited excavation were needed in order to verify or to get dates and things like that, datable materials, uh, things of, of that sort. That's a, another piece of advice for that young person that's asking the, the question, but go do it. We need, we need good archaeologists to come in uh, along behind those of us who are uh, retiring now. Well, I guess I'll put in, I'll, I'll chime in um, for, to wrap things up here. Um, you know, um, I, I think the, ver the first bit of advice that I was ever given uh, when I uh, enrolled in an archaeology class um, back at, uh, at SMU in Dallas, Texas, was uh, the professor said to a whole uh, lot of us, there was about 100 students in that class, and he said, if any one of you has... Uh, any visions of becoming rich and famous? He said, there's the door. <laughs> and I have yet to uh, run into any professional archaeologist who's um, become uh, rich. Um, and I think most of them are humble enough to say that they're not famous either. <laughs> but I will say um, from my own experience uh, to anyone who's considering this profession is if you want a profession, a career, a passion of, um, of something that you can do for an entire lifetime that will give you great experiences, uh, that will get you out into the landscape, that will get you working with uh, a multitude of people, and that you can look back when you reach retirement age and have some really great stories, uh, this, is, this is the profession that will do that. Um, like Gary has said, you know, the, the, our profession is changing. It now requires um, the use of technology. So anyone who's up and coming into this profession, if you have those technical skills, you're going to be able to do this job for a long time. Uh, it is one that, that has changed from that uh, destructive type of, of archaeology that we grew up with. It's one where we're no longer collecting all of these uh, samples. Uh, there are curation facilities across this country who are busting at the seams, who can't take any more of those collections because they have no place, no more room to curate them. So, so even that in itself is, is not something that we're, we're doing much more. Uh, but now, as you've heard here, we are engaging with those descendant communities who have much to teach us and much to share uh, with their own science, with their own traditional knowledge to help us expand that which we have done in the past that has not included their voice and has given us new uh, things to research, new things to uh, pursue. And I think that it is, it is the combination of those two, much like we've done here in this publication, uh, that has allowed us to expand this, uh, uh, expand our understanding, as well as um, expand our uh, reach to those who might choose to pursue this as a profession. So anyone who's thinking about it, I encourage you to, uh, uh, pursue it. It, it. it is the most rewarding profession you will have. Thank you, Teresa. Um, that about does it. I want to send a huge thank you to everyone who joined us, everyone who donated to support this event, all of our panelists, of course, um, and the staff at SAR who made this event possible. Um, I also want to remind you that SAR members get a 20% discount on all of our books, and there should be a link for more information in the chat, you can also go to our website. 
Um, I hope you'll join us for our next book talk, which is Thursday, June 3rd at 2 p.m. when we're going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of Senses of Place with Stephen Feld, Amal Bishara, and Christina Lyons. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we will see you next time. Bye. Thank you.